This monstrous crater, nearly three miles around, is over 60 stories deep. It may mark a moment in time when life on our planet was forever changed. Speculation suggests that a monstrous asteroid careened from its orbit and struck the Earth with apocalyptic fury. 75% of all life may have been destroyed in sudden cataclysm. Millions of asteroids churn through the abyss of space. Could one suddenly tumble towards our planet, bringing about the end of the world? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. The Arizona desert. It probably has not changed much in appearance for 25,000 years. Long ago, a huge asteroid weighing millions of tons suddenly, unexplainably, fell from its orbit and tumbled headlong towards the Earth. It probably exploded with a force far greater than any recorded nuclear explosion, leaving this crater. Founder of the American Meteorite Laboratory, Dr. H. H. Nininger. The greatest geological force that has ever operated in the crust of the Earth has been the force of impact. We have a little example of that impact here before us today. I say a little one because this one is about four-fifths of a mile across and 600 feet deep, but that is a baby by the side of others that have been found on the Earth that are old, that have been wiped out almost entirely by erosion. Originally twice as high and deep, enormous craters have been uniquely preserved by the climate of Australia. Others were blasted out of solid granite. One huge Canadian crater is even visible from space. Thousands of meteors have hit the United States itself. For the most part, their visible remains have long since been covered by the elements. The face of the moon is a clear example of impact. Seen from Earth, its craters appear as tiny pockmarks. They are actually up to hundreds of miles in diameter. It's hard to believe that our Earth's appearance was at one time very similar to the moon's today. What result did this awesome force have during our planet's ancient past? We don't find the North Pole in the past at the same location it is now by any means. It has been shifted as much as 30 or 40 degrees from time to time. And the only sensible explanation for that that I can think of is impact. Recent studies have established that our Earth's poles, as shown here, have undergone complete reversal in the past. Evidence of this sudden catastrophic shift lies hidden in the enigmatic vastness of the North Pole. Coral reefs have been discovered here, as well as trees with their fruit and leaves frozen intact. In 1900, explorers unearthed this mammoth with an unchewed mouthful of buttercups its stomach full of summer grasses. The icy Siberian tundra conceals the fact that giant woolly mammoths once roamed a lush land until a disaster froze them in an instant. Could a meteor bombardment have brought about an end to their world? P. 
hidden by its blistering entry into the atmosphere, a meteorite similar to this one contained enough iron to produce nearly 50,000 cars. It blasted this crater from the Arizona bedrock. Diamonds were created instantaneously. This computerized graphic illustrates the three million tons of crushed earth and meteor that in less than a second were strewn for miles over the surrounding countryside. One block, the size of a large house, was thrown into the crater lip. It is a mere speck in comparison to the immensity of the crater itself. A larger asteroid could have resulted in a crater the size of the state of Missouri. A meteorite, by the time it comes into view, will already be within uh, almost less than a hundred miles of its target. And a hundred miles for the travel of an asteroid or a meteorite would be covered in just a few seconds. So there is no such thing as getting ready for this thing. We'll never know in advance that one is coming. Most asteroids orbit between Jupiter and Mars. However, there are mavericks whose orbits actually cross that of our planet. Palomar Observatory in California has accelerated their research to track these potential threats. Eleanor Helene, senior scientist at California Institute of Technology, is the world's foremost asteroid tracker. She has discovered several hundred, including this one, the Ra Shalom. We could be caught unawares. Uh, it is our plan to be as prepared as we can, and I think the uh, increase in uh, general observation for survey and search will give us much more lead time to at least be aware that something is coming in close. Skylab fell from its orbit smashing into Australia. Our sophisticated technology was helpless. We could do nothing but wait and see where it would hit. Well, it's certainly uh, been our experience, unfortunately, that uh, if an object is found on a collisional course with the Earth, uh, and we've had a few exercises that uh, fortunately have not proved to be true, that uh, we really have no means of deflecting an object that is coming directly toward the Earth, at least at this time, as far as I'm aware. Because of this potential threat from space, NASA is studying the force of impact in order to know what to expect. The light gas gun, the only one of its kind on Earth, was built to study such an event. A pellet simulating a meteorite is carefully placed into the gun. A piston is locked into place. It will pump millions of pounds of high pressure hydrogen gas into the gun. A final check is carefully conducted. Because of the tremendous pressures generated, any mistake could prove fatal to the crew. The gun is raised to the vertical position. Upon firing, the pellet will hurtle down the tube at a speed nearing six miles per second. A target representing the Earth is prepared and the room is evacuated. The gun is fired. The target exhibits a striking resemblance to Meteor Crater. Planetologist Donald Galt has experimented for years with the light gas gun. Now we know that on Earth we have craters up to 100 miles in diameter. Uh, with three out of every four objects that strike the Earth landing in the ocean basins, why, we wonder what would happen if a big object struck in the ocean, say the Pacific Ocean, and produced a transient crater, is the water would collapse, a transient crater 100 miles in diameter. Uh, the ocean is only an average of two or three miles deep, so we'd just wipe the water right off the floor of the ocean for 100 miles, and it would collapse, and the tidal waves that re result from such a, an event are just, they just stagger the imagination. 
it's, 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 we just don't know what would happen really, except it would be devastation on a terrible scale. If such an object landed on land, for example, suppose it's centered right in the middle of uh, Chicago, it would totally obliterate the city and the surrounding suburbs around Lake Michigan to the north and south of Chicago. And that's a little spooky because we don't know when some big object like this is coming in and could strike the Earth. A startling theory has recently come to light, suggesting that a meteor impact could cause the end of the world. Scientists have long been perplexed by the abrupt disappearance of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Searching for clues to explain this mystery, researchers delved deeply into the ocean bottom. Drilling was conducted worldwide to collect samples of the prehistoric Earth. layer of thin clay is the soil upon which the dinosaurs lived. Closer examination with microphotography produced startling results. Fossils of living organisms vanished in the layer above, seemingly proof of sudden extinction. Further investigation was conducted at laboratories in Berkeley, California. Scientist Frank Asaro subjected the samples to complex computer analysis. The amount of iridium was found to be nearly 200 times that of the other elements in the Earth sample. The scientists were amazed. Iridium, a rare metal, is never found in this great amount on Earth. The unusually high abundance of iridium that was detected in the clay layer suggested that the Iridium came from an extraordinary extraterrestrial event. An asteroid is the only possible explanation for the incredibly high percentage of Iridium. Could a meteor crater-like event have actually brought about an end of the world? The asteroid impact theory envisions that an asteroid struck the Earth about 65 million years ago. This caused a tremendous explosion, possibly larger than 100 million megatons, and this erupted not only the asteroid mass, but uh, perhaps 60 times its mass of terrestrial material, and a good part of this went into the upper atmosphere, possibly 17 trillion tons, and this spread around the Earth, turning day into night. About this time, some 75% of all living species became extinguished. Yet asteroids are not the only threats. Comets, frozen bodies of ice and gas, twice in the last 80 years have exploded into the Russian countryside. Actual footage shows the aftermath of the 1908 Tunguska explosion. Dr. Eugene Shoemaker, world-renowned authority on cratering and recent electee to the National Academy of Science. If an event like Tunguska were to happen today over a populated part of the Earth, that event would almost surely be perceived by the people and by the nation in which it happened as a nuclear attack. This event would look to people almost exactly like a nuclear explosion. The hazard is not from the direct effects of the impact or encounter with those small asteroids, but rather how they are perceived by man and how man will react to them. If that event happens over a nation that possesses nuclear weapons, will they respond? That's the hazard, and that's the unknowable. Doomsday, apocalypse, Armageddon, Deep within the soul of humanity lies a primal fear. The fear of the total destruction of the Earth as we know it. The end of the world. Throughout time, 
we've always been at the mercy of nature's potentially catastrophic forces. Today, however, we hold the power to bring about earth-shattering holocausts ourselves. Can there possibly be a solution to these global problems? The infinite frontier, space, stretching endlessly upon itself. Could its mysterious vastness be part of the answer? Investigative research into the possibilities is being conducted at Princeton University. Dr. Gerard O'Neill, high energy physicist and NASA consultant on space related matters. We're very, very fortunate because after all of the centuries of the development of human civilization, we're just in this critical period where the breakout of humanity into space can occur within the next one or two decades for us. Perhaps the most critical breakout that there could be thought of over hundreds of years of time. Because once that happens, the human race will be unkillable. No single natural disaster can wipe it out. And once that happens, all the other transitions going out throughout the solar system, eventually even to other stars, are far, far easier than this one critical breakout that we're about to make at this time. NASA's space shuttle is at the forefront of present space technology. It is our first step towards the use of space as a refuge. This craft and others like it will one day be our galactic covered wagons to the stars. The whole point about the high frontier of space is that it's a virtually unlimited resource of energy and materials. We're suffering increasing poverty here on the surface of the Earth and it makes sense to go out and begin using that wealth of solar energy and of materials. Huge solar panels, many square miles in area, could one day beam limitless energy through space. Solar energy is eight times as efficient there and reliable 24 hours a day. Ironically, the asteroids we fear will one day be mined for their valuable resources of iron and nickel. To accomplish this, Dr. O'Neill and his colleagues have invented the mass driver, an intricately designed motor that converts electrical energy into motion at speeds exceeding 15 miles per second. It will accelerate mined resources to processing stations in space. In evolutionary terms, it's a very natural thing for us to move out into the new environment of space and begin using the resources that are there humanity has always moved into new areas where natural resources could be found. In the long run, people are going to be moving out into space in considerable numbers. It turns out that the, the material resources that exist even relatively nearby are enough to build about 3,000 times the land area of the Earth in the form of space colonies. Going to a space colony would be, in the beginning, a little like taking a trip across the ocean by ship. It would take about uh, five to seven days of travel time in a very comfortable ship with its own artificial gravity. At tremendous speeds, the transfer craft would jet far beyond terrestrial boundaries, penetrating into the profound silence of space. Through a zero-gravity corridor, one would begin moving down into the colony. A large valley would open out, possibly filled with lakes, trees, grass, and flowers. Unburdened by heavy industry, a colony could be a very sylvan, park-like environment. Each colony, supporting perhaps 50 to 100,000 people, could be unique. Work would be done in nearby modules, each a complete ecosystem, self-supporting and independent. Air, water, and other resources would be completely recycled. Constant access to the sun would give the ability to control the seasons at will. Giant hothouses would allow crops to be grown year-round. At first heavily dependent on the earth, the colonies eventually would become miniature worlds of their own. Technological advancements would release us from many laborious tasks, which are presently a necessity. This would allow more time for personal creativity and experimentation. Dr. O'Neill believes that by the middle of the next century, millions of us will be moving out into space.
National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. chronicles the quest to expand our earthly limits, pushing beyond our boundaries, ever in quest of new challenges. What was impossible 40 years ago is commonly accepted today. Technology has clearly begun to satisfy our desire to conquer space itself. The International Committee for the Future's president, Barbara Marks Hubbard, has testified before the Congressional Subcommittee on Space. One of the fascinating things about outer space is you've got to cooperate to live. I think we'll learn new models of how people can work together. Because there, if you, if you fight, you die immediately. Maybe it's a new place for the human race to learn how to live together. And the people on Earth will learn lessons from what the people in space are doing on the new frontier. Right now on planet Earth, we're in a zero-sum game. One nation can't gain without taking resources away from another, and that's why we see hostility increasing all around us. I think that if we can move out into an environment where there's virtually unlimited energy and material resources for everyone, we ought to find it possible to live with less hostility than there is at the present time. That's certainly my hope. It's the step probably of the greatest freedom and emancipation that the human race has ever known. There's been a long history of freedom, if you think of it, starting in the early caves, and then exploring the seas, and then going over the mountains, and then getting in the airplanes and seeing if we could fly. At every step, people said, we can't do it. They were the impossibilists. And then there were the possibilists that expanded human freedom. There is always the lure of the possible future. What humanity envisions can often be achieved. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world, seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians. <laughs>